welcome. I'm extremely pleased that um, quite a few of you came, some of you from quite far away, um, to uh, today's Mark M. Salton Memorial Lecture given by Andrew Burnett. Um, you know, I always hate it when people say Andrew is, is someone that, uh, you know, needs no introduction. But in this case, it's no. probably true. <laughs> so I won't say anything about him, no. Um, <laughs> he's, of course, uh, well known to all of you who are numismatists um, as the author of a great many books, in particular um, a book that we use um, all the time, Roman Provincial Coinage, with that he co-authored with um, Michel Amandry. Um, he is, however, known for very many other um, areas of expertise um, that he has assembled over his many years <coughs> um, as a <coughs> first curator, then keeper in the Department of Coins and Medals in the British Museum, and uh, where he also served for quite a few years as deputy director. <coughs> Um, difficult job, obviously, and so he spent really his entire life, um, which is impressive for those. Um, there are not that many people um, nowadays that start their career in one place and and leave it. And Andrew is one of them. So 1974 to 2013, this is really incredible, Andrew. Um, I, of course, um, as you know, um, that I was I worked with Andrew there. He was um, my boss there for quite a few years and um, we learned obviously a lot from Andrew in particular <coughs> the breadth of knowledge and the interest that um, certainly I've tried to bring to the ANS perhaps not quite as successfully as he in the British Museum. His honours, um, I won't list them all, um, they're really uh, a very great many and I just want to um, list our own which is that he's of course um, the Huntington medalist but there is all the other um, incredible list of things that he has done. Now turning to what he's going to do, um, what he's doing right now, in fact, um, the talk, as you saw, is announced as Roman Coins, Money and Elizabethan Society, an unknown work by Sir Thomas Smith. And I've been told that this is the same, uh, this is the title also of a forthcoming book, um, on this very subject, and uh, so we are all eagerly anticipating this book. Um, however, it is not even clear whether <coughs> this won't be published by the American Numismatic Society or someone else. Um, in any case, we very much look forward to this, and this is sort of a little bit of a pitch for, you know, how interesting the subject is, and this is something that not just Andrew, but some other people, um, an area that they've moved into, which is the history of numismatics itself. Um, which is very interesting, and so I'm now going to leave it to Andrew to explain what this is all about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uta, for that uh, kind introduction. There is a handout to go with this evening's uh, talk. Well, it's always a great pleasure to be here at the uh, ANS. Um, and I obviously have a, a long association uh, with the NS. I came here as a visiting scholar in 1982, and Uta was kind enough to mention the Roman Provincial Coinage Project, which actually was conceived and begun during my time here as a uh, visiting scholar, because it was the first and was possibly the only time in my, my life, and I've had enough time to really think about what serious big projects one might be able to do. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that particular project also began because uh, we were doing at the time an exhibition in the VM on the image of Augustus and I got very frustrated that there wasn't a proper reference book about the coin <coughs> of the provinces for, the, um, for Augustus. And of course, if you get frustrated, the only thing to do is either shut up or write it yourself. So I did. <laughs> and in a sense, that's why I'm here this evening because as Uta said, I've always been interested in the history of numismatics and it's always seemed to me axiomatic that if you're studying a subject you need to know what your <coughs> predecessors said about it and how they thought about it, how do we get here. Uh, and for the same reason um, I've got over the years got frustrated by the fact that uh, the history of numismatics isn't very well accounted for and particularly not so in England. 
that if you look at uh, some of the histories of the subject, for example, Babylon's great uh, Traité de Numismatique, you'll find quite uh, full accounts of what's going on in, in other uh, European countries, particularly France, Italy, Germany, and the Low Countries, but you'll find very little about what's happening um, in England. So I conceived uh, this project that I've now embarked on to try and write a history of numismatics in England, Britain, um, between uh, about 1500 and about 1800, because everybody knows the story after 1800 when places like the British Museum became a very uh, big force in the development of numismatics. But what happened before, and why was so little attention uh, paid to things in Britain before? Uh, and that was the question I set out to answer. Uh, and I've discovered that, in fact, this isn't quite what happened. It wasn't that nothing much happened in Britain before the 19th century. In fact, a great deal did happen, but for various reasons, some was accidental, mostly accidental, um, very little of it was actually published. Uh, so not very much is known today of that early history. The first person to really try and write about the history of numismatics in Britain <coughs> was John Pinkerton in the late uh, 18th century. Uh, and he already then said he didn't really know when the study of the subject began in Britain. He thought it probably went back to William Camden, the great antiquarian, who wrote the book, the famous book Britannia, the history uh, of Britain, uh, in about uh, just before 1600. This was the time when, because scholars had come to reject the mythology of ancient Britain, how it was founded by the Trojans and so on, they had to find some way of uh, finding a new source of evidence for constructing a Britain, uh, history of Britain, if you didn't believe in these ancient mythological stories. And they turned to things like place names, inscriptions, uh, and coins. So it wasn't a, a, a bad uh, idea on the part of Pinkerton that Camden uh, might have been the first serious numismatist in Britain. But in fact, he was wrong uh, by about a hundred years. And we can find a bit of the story beginning uh, in just after the years 1500, uh, and I'm not going to talk about the very first phase uh, of uh, un in the reign of Henry VIII, uh, the uh, English king in the early 16th century, when we know a certain amount about one or two figures, such as the famous Thomas More, Sir Thomas More, who's executed by um, Henry VIII, um, and indeed uh, someone you won't have heard of, Cuthbert Tunstall, who was a bishop um, of London and then Durham, who we know now did have uh, coin collections and were very interested in them. But I'm going to talk this evening about someone you've never heard of, uh, Sir Thomas Smith. And I should say that uh, what I'm going to say is very much part of a joint effort of myself and, and two other people called uh, Richard Simpson and Deborah Thorpe, Deborah, Deborah Thorpe all, all of whose skills have been applied to either reading manuscripts or, uh, or finding out more about Smith himself. So what am I going to... Um, do this evening? Well, I'm, first of all, I'm going to introduce you to Thomas Smith, who, as I say, you've never heard of, although everybody should have heard of, obviously. Uh, secondly, I'm going to cover what did he say in this unknown work, uh, and what did he do specifically with coins in it. Uh, and then thirdly, I'm going to try and answer the questions of why is this so interesting, apart, of course, from its intrinsic interest that it is, as will emerge, the first bit of writing in England, significant writing um, on coinage um, that, that, that we know. So, um, I should have put up the first uh, slide. Well, I think we've heard that bit. Um, so, who, first of all, um, was Smith? Well, he was born in 1513 and died in 1577. Uh, and we have very few authentic likenesses of him. This is probably the only one of this procession of the Knights of the Garter made in uh, 1576, just the year before he died. Uh, and this is from the labeling, this is him here, uh, is, is, as I say, the only uh, image we have of him. But obviously it was done late in life when he perhaps past his best, as you can perhaps see from <laughs> this picture. <laughs> so he, he, uh, he began his career, well, he began his life, he began his education at the University of Cambridge, where he went at the age of 11. 
Now, this actually wasn't that usual in those days. I mean, people had very different careers in universities in those days. You'd often go to a university, particularly Oxford or Cambridge, when you were 11, 12 or 13. Uh, you might stay there till your early 20s. You might then get a fellowship by the time you were 30, and you then perhaps might become head of a college or vice chancellor in your 30s. And many people would leave by the time they got to the age of 40 and have a career in politics or the church or something like that. Well, in Smith's case, he did follow a pattern like this, uh, having arrived at 11 at uh, Queen's College um, um, in Cambridge. He then went on to become a fellow of the college. Uh, he was the first Regis Professor of Law, despite the fact he was a brilliant scholar. Uh, and then he was also appointed uh, Vice-Chancellor um, in, 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 indeed, his, uh, his 30s. He then uh, left um, the University of Cambridge and one was one of the people who did then follow a public career in politics, particularly under the British uh, uh, rulers Edward VI, the son of Henry VIII, uh, not so much under Mary because um, obviously Henry VIII and VI were Protestants, Mary was a Catholic, and all the administration of the proper predecessor were kicked out and she became queen. Uh, and then again under her successor, uh, Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, who reigned from 1558 to 1603. Uh, and he rose to great heights um, of uh, political prominence. He was one of the two principal secretaries, that's the two most important ministers of the government um, under um, both Edward VI and um, Elizabeth. Uh, he was also a, a brilliant um, scholar. He was recognised at the time to be the best person, the best classical scholar, the best uh, philologist for Greek and Latin of the time in the University of Cambridge. Here we have um, this picture of Queen's College. This is the library here of Queen's College. I don't know if people have been there. This is, of course, existed in those days. This is where he would actually have worked. This is one of these much later portraits, probably not authentic, but gives you a rough idea. And here you can see he's holding this globe, which indeed is still in the library in Queen's uh, College uh, today. So there's a, a nice link there. So he was a great uh, scholar of classical languages, and particularly Greek. He was part of the revolution that then took place on the pronunciation of Greek, how um, until that time uh, Greek had been pronounced much as it is today in modern Greece, where, as you know, all the vowels are pronounced in the same way. Uh, and Smith and other scholars, particularly Sir John Cheek in England and of course more famously Erasmus in the Low Countries, decided that this wasn't right. And if the Greeks had meant all the vowels to sound the same, they would have written them all the same. Uh, and they developed this new, uh, as they called it, correct pronunciation of ancient Greek, which is still the one that, if any of you have uh, studied Greek, uh, is in use uh, today. So I bet you didn't know that you were with that to Thomas Smith. It was actually a very controversial um, a change as well because it affected the way people wrote about the New Testament and so on. He also wrote a number of political tracts of which the most famous is probably De Republicae Angliae Anglorum on about the Republic of the British um, which uh, adumbrated the doctrine <coughs> that the king of the, the monarch <coughs> required the um, assent of Parliament to be a true king. But, uh, and of course, this became a fantastically important view in the subsequent century in the events leading up to the execution of King Charles I, who, of course, refused to acknowledge the um, sovereignty of Parliament over him. But I think no one had actually been more startled than Smith that he, to find his work was used in this way. I'm sure that's not what he meant at the time when he wrote it. Uh, in his uh, uh, epitaph, which you can't quite read, on his tomb, which is still in a nice little parish church just east of London. Uh, he describes the various things he did, like being a lawyer, a politician, and so on, uh, in Latin. He describes himself, interestingly, for this evening's thought, mathematicus, a mathematician. I'm afraid so he doesn't use the word numismaticus, so perhaps we can't regard him as the first English numisma numismatist. But as well as his classical learning and his political activity, he did um, a number of other things. Um, for example, architecture. This is the rather, rather lovely house he built, which is still surviving. I went there last summer, again, just outside 
London, which was one of the first houses in Britain in the 16th century to bring in the sort of the French um, approach to neoclassical architecture uh, to to England. And you can see it is sort of classical in appearance. Oops, go back one. But uh, but it's un it's not. As you can see it's not properly symmetrical here, which of course it would have been if it was a proper uh, neoclassical uh, building as they then came. So he revolutionised politics, he revolutionised classical learning, he revolutionised architecture, not bad for someone you've not heard of, but he also did some things which were a bit disastrous. He founded a colony in Ireland, a uh, base called Elizabetha, named after the Queen, uh, based very much on what he read in classical authors about how a colony should be founded. So he very much had the Roman past in his mind. It was a disaster and had to be abandoned. He also lost most of his fortune when he uh, decided to invest in a new method of turning uh, lead into copper. Well, <laughs> <laughs> So, if this wasn't enough, he wrote this uh, book on the wages of the Roman foot soldier that we're going to uh, look at this evening. Uh, so, first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about the sources we have for this book, and then we'll look a bit more at the book of itself, what th what's in it, what date it was written, and so on and so forth. Well, as I say, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not published. It exists in three main manuscripts, two in the British Library, BL on this slide, one in the Society of Antiquaries, and we know something about the history of these manuscripts. One of them probably belonged to someone called Sir Robert Cotton, who was a great antiquarian, around about 1600. His manuscripts now form one of the core parts of the, of the British Library in London, and who probably was the person who told Camden what to say about coins in his book um, on Britain. And they probably all derived these letters from a copy that we know is in possession of someone called William Cecil, Lord Burley, who was the most important politician of the late um, 16th century. So, you know, this is not just antiquarians fiddling around in the back streets of Oxford. This is serious politicians being interested um, in the subject. Um, we, we, the book consists of 30 chapters in these manuscripts. The one chapter it seems to be lost, although people think they found it, um, but probably not. And as I say, copies, as well as copies surviving, we hear of copies given to Cecil, and even, of course, Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, the man who famously wanted to get off with Queen Elizabeth, but she didn't not seem to wish to reciprocate. Um, <laughs> so again, perhaps that's new light for you on the Earl of Essex, that he was really a numismatist. <coughs> so just briefly, some rather tedious slides of some of the um, manuscripts. This is where my ability to um, study this on my own was severely limited, where I was very glad to have the help of Deborah and, um, uh, and Richard. Uh, uh, and these, uh, this is the, on the left, is the beginning of the, uh, this, the, t the title page, the contents of the book, which you have um, on the handout in front of you. And then on the right is just uh, is, is some other pages. Um, you can see bits about, um, oh, sorry, you am pressing the wrong one, about dinar drachmas and denarius, Sestertiae, and so on, Victoriatus, down here. Gives you a sort of flavour of what this manuscript um, is like. So they're quite hard to um, read. And uh, in the early, in summer copies, bits are missing um, because the, the copyist who was copying this manuscript didn't know uh, Greek. Uh, and there was a little quotation from Greek here. He obviously left it for someone else to do. So we find in one copy, we have a bit of Greek here, which is, is missing in this one. And uh, this turns out to be a quotation from Homer. I have to say, not identified as such by me, but a more distinguished uh, classicist. Um, so we have these three manuscripts, none of which is easy to read, and have long passages of Latin and some bits of Greek in them. And we also have uh, some of his uh, notebooks, which are preserved today in his old college, uh, Queen's College, although they don't seem to have been there since his time, but were only acquired much later in the 18th century. So, and this is probably examples of his handwriting, what he actually wrote. Um, you can perhaps just about make out 
Aure Roman Ni Quatawo Pride Bant Onsian that Paul Roman Ari um, come from uh, an ant and, and th things like that. So these are the sources that we've got to put together um, the uh, work that we're now hoping, as Uta said, to publish. So that's roughly um, the sources we have. Uh, when uh, was it written? Well, it was probably written in the form we have it in about 1562, which uh, those of you who know about 16th century English numismatics will know is quite a, a significant period because it was the period which marked the end of the terrible debasement of the coinage which had been begun by Henry VIII. Well, of course, the coinage had been restored to its uh, purity earlier than 1560, 1561, but that was the year in which Elizabeth, um, on advice, advice of including Smith, as we'll see in a minute, decided to uh, undertake the great re-coinage when all the base metal coinage was removed from circulation and replaced um, by uh, pure silver, which was, at the time, uh, th the thing that she was most uh, uh, famous for. She was recognised much more for that than, for example, defeating the Spanish Armada, which is what people know about her um, today. Uh, the reason we uh, believe this is the date when the work was written is partly, for example, this is the, the book is dedicated to uh, William uh, Cecil, and, and he became, uh, he was ennobled as a baron in 1571, so the fact he's not called baron in the dedication means the work must be um, earlier than that. And there are various other arguments and clues which I won't go into, which support a date um, about 10 years before that, in about 1562. It was probably based on an earlier draft that he wrote as a, as a younger man, possibly in the 1540s, uh, 20 years before, and we know from some letters that just before he died, when you, he was the age when you saw him in that picture, the first picture we saw, he was intending uh, to revise it. And he was all set to revise it, but unfortunately he couldn't find his own copy, so he couldn't revise it. And, and that's why we know about, for example, the Earl of Essex and Lord Burley having a copy, because he wrote to them saying, Have you, can you find that copy of my book I gave you, because I want to revise it. So, I don't know if this rings any bells with any authors in this in this room. So if that's the um, when it's written, what was it called? Well, it's referred to in the few uh, passages that mention it in various different ways, particularly two ways. One about uh, the wages of a Roman foot soldier. This is someone called Mary Dewar, who's wrote the only biography of Sir Thomas Smith. Now over 50 years ago, we have, uh, and some contemporary references. A commentary on uh, numismatic matters. Uh, here, the, one, the titles and some of the manuscripts, are, which are related to him, a book touching the wages given to the Roman soldier, uh, and, 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 and so on. So there is some lack of clarity about was the book called something like On the Wages of the Roman Foot Soldier, or was it called um, About um, Roman Coins? Uh, and although th this is um, perhaps worrying that we don't know exactly what it was called, uh, it is, it, I think it does actually reflect the contents of the book uh, quite well, because if you analyse how much of the uh, manuscript is devoted to these themes, you find pretty much exactly 50% is devoted to the question of how much was the Roman soldier paid and how much was devoted to how much were Roman coins worth in contemporary English coins. Now these are both interesting topics. The idea of trying to compare ancient Roman values with contemporary ones wasn't a new idea, but had been begun on the continent by the great French scholar, Guillaume Boudet, about uh, 50 years before. And the idea had been picked up I in other countries. And of course, people, because they all read their ancient authors and they encountered these words like denarius and Cistercius, but what did it mean? So there was a lot of... Uh, so it was very worthwhile trying to provide people with a guide to what were the actual sums these ancient authors were talking about. And the second theme, I find it in a sense even more interesting, what was the wages of the Roman uh, legionary, the Roman soldier, because although Smith uh, was writing about it in 1560, I'm glad to, to tell you, and some of you will know, that it's still a matter that has not yet been satisfactorily resolved. 
So I think, but I don't think many of the people who write learned articles, for example, I refer to one here by Richard Alston, um, are aware that they are the lat later part of a controversy that's been going on for over 500 years. So good for Smith. So that was what he was trying to do. And if you, I mean, I, I, let's not go through the, the handout in detail. What I've given you is the uh, list of contents of the book. Uh, some of it's written in Old English, which you may find a bit difficult to read at first. The thing I always recommend is if you read it out aloud, then suddenly you say, oh, that's, that's, that's what he means. For example, um, under um, item two, when the Romans gave first wages to their soldiers, footmen, their foot soldiers, and then, and with what joy that was taken of the common people of Rome and how it was levied. So you know, it does take a bit of working out, even when you can read what the uh, letters are. But you, you, you can see from the chapter headings that it's things about uh, military pay. And then he talks about number six, of our English money and the first standard, uh, and then about Roman coins. And then later down the page, the different sorts of denarius, different sorts of English, English coins, for example, number 18, the English royal or the old Edward coin of Edward is in goodness and weight equal to the second RE of the Romans of uh, his four, four to the uh, um, 28 uh, pounds to 28 coins to the pound. And uh, the, the book sort of goes round, I have to say, in a slightly uh, circum circumlocutory way, uh, these themes before. Um, he comes to his conclusions, which we'll come to in a minute. So how did he uh, put together, what was his methodology? Because of course, unlike all you when you write your article, you're, you're relying on hundreds of years of numismatic methodology. Smith's case, there was nothing in England, there was some continental writing he could fall back on, but not a lot. So he used essentially two uh, main sources. One was the consultation of ancient authors and contemporary writers. And then the second, which is why it's of interest, I think, to, 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 the, to, to, to us as numismatists, he, 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 we know now from this book that he had his own collection, that he weighed the coins in it to try and establish Roman weight standards. Uh, and it's quite, quite amusing what he says about how de doctors are better at lawyers, because doctors are going to have a much, the, the two classes of people who had written most coin books by that date were either doctors or lawyers. And, uh, and, and doctors, he thought, were much better because they're much more precise at weighing things out. They have to get the pill of the right weight and so on and so forth, whereas lawyers just <coughs> go on and on. This, I think, coming from the first Regis Professor of Law is quite ironic. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. uh, and then, at the end, he, um, he tried to uh, compare what he observed himself by his own autopsy of the coins with what he read in the authors. So a brief look at the written sources. He used one or two English documentary sources. He refers to them here, but as you can see, he didn't really, um, he didn't really have much to go on. There'd been no collection at that stage of um, English medieval charters and laws for uh, numismatists and money historians to, to analyze. There were just a few things um, that he knew. And as you can see, I mean, often he didn't, um, um, he didn't really know um, which particular king he was dealing with sometimes. Um, I'll skip over this one. And he also used, I don't know if you can read this at the back of the room, lots of ancient authors. And when I compiled this list, I have to say I was a bit astonished because although um, a number of people you know well on this list, Cicero, Livy, Tacitus, Pliny, um, there are quite a lot of names which even to those of us who think we are um, reasonably educated classicists uh, are unusual. Who in the audience has ever heard of Scribonius Largus, a little known author of the reign of the Emperor Augustus? And most intriguing of all, fourth from the top, Cleopatra, who's this? And indeed, there is quite a good case, and has just been made by a Cambridge scholar in the last few years, per se, this is actually Queen Cleopatra herself. Again, you know, new light on an old friend that Cleopatra actually wrote a book she wasn't just a dumb blonde or whatever. <laughs> um, and, and, it, and it was relevant to the understanding of the metrology of Roman coins. Well, there we are. Now, it'd be nice, to, as I said, Smith was a very learned classical scholar, and it'd be nice to think that he'd read all these books in great detail himself. 
And I'm sure he did know the classical sources very well. One of the things that you learn when you uh, look at antiquarian books is just how well people did know the sources compared with today. They just knew the ancient literature so much better. But indeed, Smith, like indeed some people today, was not, um, un, uh, was not untempted by taking shortcuts. Uh, for example, if we um, compare what some of what he says with what you find in a book which he acknowledges to be a very good book, which he used a lot, a book by a man called Georgius Agricola, not to be confused with the ancient Agricola, the title of the book by Tacitus, but a man who wrote on um, weights and measures in the early 16th century, you can see that there's a very close um, similarity between what they say and, 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 and what sources they quote. Just to give another example here, this is indeed our friend Cleopatra, who says that the Attic Mina has 12 ounces and a half, uh, and there you find the same thing uh, down here in um, Agricola. Indeed, when you compare the uh, list of ancient authors that Smith uses with the ones used by Agricola, you find that uh, they are pretty much the same. But as I say, one can exaggerate the extent to which uh, Smith takes his information from secondary sources. And it was with one of the great uh, discoveries of this project was that we, um, in, in Queen's College in Cambridge, still survive some of Smith's books. And this is his copy, a little bit eaten, as you can see, by bookworms. David, please note. Um, here his text, and you can see it's been underlined, and it's got uh, marginal notes. And uh, when we look at what he says about tac Tacitus, you probably can't read it, these passages that he's marked are exactly the same ones that turn up um, in his book. So it's almost as if by looking at this copy of the book of Tacitus in Cambridge today, we can look over his um, shoulder um, and uh, see him hard at work in that library, of which we saw the slide a few minutes ago. So I say he did also rely a lot on uh, modern authors, Ion Boudet I've mentioned, and the, then, the, then the awful law lawyers, Portio and Alciati, Cuthbert Tunstall, who was the bishop, English bishop, and, and as I mentioned at the bottom, um, George um, Agricola. Uh, and probably the most important um, of these was uh, Boudet, this, uh, this, uh, this great French scholar who wrote his book um, at the beginning of the 16th century. I don't know if anyone has tried to read it. Every year I tell myself I'm going to try and read this book, which is uh, five uh, dense books of chaotically written information, all of course in uh, difficult Latin, uh, but I have to say, so far, I haven't quite uh, managed to succeed um, in that goal. There, there is an abridgment, which he was in French, which is a lot, lot easier. But you can see uh, the admiration he has for um, Boudin, and, and quite rightly, it's been recognised as one of the great philological masterpieces of the 16th century and didn't really have its equal for a very long time um, afterwards. And again, we can see uh, Smith in action using it. Here, if we look in, this is from that notebook we saw earlier in Queen's College today. Here we can see he's, uh, he's, he's making notes here um, about, uh, when well in fact he's taking this from Tunstall, Bishop Tunstall, but also Budayo, Bud Bude. And, he, and he's written down this, uh, this, the, this, this bit here, for example, the Arius has, um, the time of Otho has, hundred sestertii, that is um, 25 denarii, and here, just like a modern scholar, he's given the reference, Bude, book two, de Asse, um, page 102, and book three, I mean, again, it's a very vivid testimony to the work which he was undertaking himself, and that probably does show he did actually read this book himself. So, and I say, as well as Bude, the other author he admired particularly was uh, Georgus Agricola, um, a German scholar who was probably called Georg Bauer. Bauer is the German for farmer, hence uh, Agricola. Uh, and again, you can see the great uh, admiration he had for his work. He, he was like the light of the sun, uh, which doth surmount the starlight. This is how he rather metaf metaphorically and rather um, uh, evocatively described um, Agricola's work and influence. 
But I mean, the bit you've all been waiting for, as well as these texts, he used his own coins himself, and he refers to a number of them. And this is this is the first time we have coins described in any detail um, in England, and let alone being actually used for any serious purpose. And I don't know how many Republican collectors there are here this evening, but you can see the the, the yeah. descriptions he makes are really very. I mean, there's no difficulty at all. He may misunderstand some of the things he sees. There's no difficulty at all in, in, um, in um, understanding it. And he knows, for example, the 10 means is the, yeah, is the mark of the denarius and so on. We'll just flip through a few of them. Another one, another quadrugatus with four horses joined, and not as they're running, but rather trotting. And under them, Domi, the face with the helmet and wing as before, and before the face of Roma, um, uh, uh, before the face Roma, behind X. Two, ho two horsemen running with long spears under an M. Pitus, under that Roma. On the other side, a face with a helmet and wing, as the other two had, and uh, that cross, the X, also. Uh, this is what I got quite excited about, because again, some of you will know that um, Republican coins often have secret marks, well not secret marks, control marks of different letters of the alphabet or different numbers. And here he is describing one, uh, which I'm going to place on the, other, on the one side behind it, Piedos, and before it, N. Here's this one of these letters that only occurs um, on, in this case, one or two dies. Now, unfortunately for us, he puts a dot after it, and this does have a dot, but that's just how they did letters on their own, they always put dots behind it, so we don't know um, if, he, if he really meant it had just an N or an N with a dot. And I, I got even more excited when I found one of the rare specimens of this particular variety was indeed in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. But I'm afraid I've been very disappointed because uh, it seems to have been acquired um, relatively um, modernly in the, in the 20th century. So although conceivably it might be Smith's coin which is recirculated, um, there's no direct evidence, which is why I was telling David I want to consult the great Charles Hirsch and Rick Wachonke dossier of control marks which you have in your library just to see if there's any chance of pinning um, this down. Uh, another one. Uh, and then I think this is the, the last Republican one. So we have um, a number of different uh, Republican uh, coins described. He then moves on from them, as that isn't interesting enough, to try and establish the weight standard used by the Romans on the basis of weighing these coins. Well, perhaps not weighing them himself. My guess is he probably got a local goldsmith to weigh them. And here, in these very complicated, gives these very complicated for formulas, which we can work out um, in in modern uh, weights as well. So, if one could find a plausible coin for the one with the N on it. If we could now check the weight uh, and see if it really, um, if it really was the same. So he weighs these coins, and then he immediately encounters the problem that many of you will be familiar with: you weigh coins, but how do you make the leap from that to establishing a weight standard? You know, is it the average weight? Is it the median weight? Is it the upper weight, or what? So what he says he's going to do is he says he's always spent his time trying to find very well preserved specimens and that's what he's going to base his weight standard on. And he constructs this table of four main and some sub um, Roman weight standards which is a bit strange because some of them definitely existed. The second, um, um, uh, fourth and fifth on this table but the others um, seem to be imaginary and the most odd one is how this one which must be the early imperial period, Vespasian Trajan a Hadrian and Antoninus, um, well, he, the weight he gives is much, much too heavy for that. So that is a bit of a puzzle. But even if there are problems with it, it's you know, very exciting to see someone trying to work out what the Roman pound was, what the standards of Roman coinage was um, at the time. This is in the 1540s. He also, um, did, had we know, did some calculations based on gold coins. Uh, and this um, this is what he says about um, these coins of uh, Claudius here. And I must say, it's terrible. This is the first Roman gold coin recorded um, from Britain in this book in 1537. 
And what is it? Amazingly, it's a gold coin of Claudius celebrating the defeat, the capture of Britain. It's, it's sort of almost too good to be true. And he, um, he moves on from this, again, to try and construct um, more something about the Roman pound. Um, because he, he weighed this coin, although he doesn't actually tell us exactly what this one weighed, but we know what he would have found, because we know how much these coins weigh. And then he looked up his text of Pliny, uh, where he could find a text that said um, these coins were worth, uh, were, were made at 48 to the pound. And he does the multiplication, and, he's, and he comes up with the amazing well, it's not a coincidence, he thinks, because it's more important than that, that the Roman pound and the English contemporary pound uh, were the same. But, of course, we know that's completely wrong. The um, Roman pound weighed about 323 grams. The contemporary English uh, Troy pound weighed about 370. So he, he got that wrong, but actually he got it wrong for reasonably respectable reasons. He weighed the coin, and he used the text of Pliny. Now, unfortunately, that text of Pliny is uh, notoriously corrupt uh, and where he read uh, 40, 48 uh, modern scholars have, uh, have decided that the reading should actually be something else for precisely this uh, problem. So he may be wrong but the methodology is undoubtedly uh, sound. So that's what he does with the coins. Can we say a bit about what his collection was? Well we can't say very much about it. There are a few clues. He tells us how when he was a young man and scholar in Cambridge, of curiosity and desire to know the value of old coin in comparison with ours, I travelled, I travailed to get always as I could in my hands such old ancient coins as neither seemed clipped nor washed and had their inscription fair. So the principle I just said of having well preserved coins. And from the clues we find in the book, we can construct a sort of sense of roughly what he had. There don't seem to be any Greek coins, definitely some Republican coins, definitely some imperial coins, including the gold Claudius, uh, and some uh, medieval coins, um, although, um, um, as, he, um, as he says, I mean, he's, he's, n he's not terribly sure um, which, uh, which, which coin, um, uh, which, which king made these coins. I've always thought this is actually one of the great, I was talking to David about earlier today, um, uh, this, this evening, how on earth did people work out with the English medieval coinage, all of which just say Eduardus or Henricus? How on earth did they work out which was Henry the I, which was Edward I, II and III? It seems obvious to us, but it was a great triumph of scholarship um, at the time. So we get some sense of what he had. The other sense we can get is from how much his collection was worth after his death, uh, although we don't know exactly. There's this one reference to his collection of coins, pl probably plus some other things, being worth £200. And we can do some calculations from a um, slightly later period, which suggests that maybe he had of the order of 1,000 coins, certainly um, a few hundred, and probably about 1,000, um, which is uh, appreciable. It's not actually very large by the continental comparisons. We hear of much bigger collections on the continent of 20 or 30,000, although again perfectly respectable and well-known collectors had collections there of no more than about a thousand coins. So now having um, described a bit about the way out, I'll, I'll t a few more of the, th the interesting things we can derive from it. Uh, and the first thing is that we now know much more about, let's call it, the English numismatic scene. Uh, and we've been able to reconstruct from this book a number, a number of people were interested in coins that we just didn't know about before. And I'd call them the Cambridge Numismatic Club, 16th century, because bizarrely, they all seem to come from Cambridge. And even more bizarrely, apart from Smith himself, who was at Queen's College, as you can see from this um, table, they all, um, they all come from St. John's College. This is a bit of a, a mystery. Um, and in fact, earlier this uh, year, I went to the centenary um, conference for Roger Ascombe, whose date of birth seems to have changed now to 1516 in the last few years, which is why they had the centenary conference this year, who was at St John's, and I asked them if they had any sense of what was going on at St John's at the time, but there seems to be no um, obvious answer to that. And, and what's interesting about uh, this, this list is that, um, as well as being 
a list of uh, distinguished academics at Cambridge, they were also include a number of people who um, played an important role in politics. We already mentioned Smith and Cecil we've mentioned. Uh, Roger Ascham, or Ascham, nobody knows how to pronounce his name, was the tutor of Queen Elizabeth, a distinguished scholar, uh, and also of Robert Dudley, who we also um, mentioned um, earlier. Uh, and John Cheek was also very as uh, well an important classical scholar, played a quite important role um, in the government. And this uh, Cambridge connection, which is a term I borrowed from a book published about 20 years ago, these are almost exactly the same people who we turn up, who turn up in English politics as being the people who ensured a smooth transition from the Catholic uh, reign of Queen Mary to the Protestant reign of Queen Elizabeth. A transition which we again perhaps take for granted, but at the time was going to be potentially a very dangerous uh, and difficult thing to achieve. And it's nice to think that maybe coins and numismatics played at least a tiny role in this. This was perhaps one of the common interests that bound this group of people together uh, and, and, and kept, kept them working together to ensure this uh, smooth transition. Well, if that's perhaps a little fanciful, we can turn to perhaps more. Uh, likely things and the most obvious one arising from what I've been saying is the themes that emerge from the uh, book uh, of which I think there are two most important ones one was that the contemporary British English scene was very like the Roman scene uh, and secondly the question of debasement and the two are clearly related so Smith is elated by his, dis his discovery that the Roman pound was the same as the English pound shows a great affinity between the two great nations and also by his work on the pay of the Roman soldier because he decided the Roman soldier was paid a denarius a day which at his time was and his calculations was the same as a groat which was indeed the pay of an English soldier at the time so this, this shows that there's some sort of underlying similarity between great nations he also very conscious because of his um, understanding of the Roman world, of the importance of debasement um, in moral terms, in terms of the moral degradation of an empire, so, so that a man may see the decay of the empire even in their coin. And as I was saying, this is a really live issue in the mid-16th century, um, what to do about the terrible state um, of the English coinage. And as, as I've said, the um, uh, the great recoinage took place in 1560 to 1561 and this book was finalised in the form we have it in 1562 and that can't be a coincidence and indeed we hear later that um, as well as Lord Burley it was he and uh, Sir Thomas Smith who were most influential in persuading uh, Queen Elizabeth to undertake this what seemed really an enormously <coughs> risky undertaking um, at the time. <coughs> So, I hope I've shown that the book is of it not only of intrinsic interest, but also has uh, a great uh, implications and helps us understand quite a lot of things that were going on in the contemporary Elizabethan political uh, world. It's not just an antiquarian work, but it's um, a work that enables us to see how numismatics, as I've said, was one of the things that knitted together the politicians uh, and indeed academics of the time. It's had obviously a, an unsatisfactory afterlife, the fact that none of you had ever heard of it or Smith before you came this evening is not good and Mary Dewar, the authoress of this one um, biography of uh, Smith is very dismissive, dismissive of it even though at the time William Camden, the great scholar, as you can see um, thought um, much more or highly um, of it and I would like to think that despite um, as it were history very tacitly agreeing with Dewar over the years and enabling the work to be forgotten nevertheless Camden was perhaps uh, more on the ball on the, on the correct sort of um, uh, judgment so my hope is that although he was forgotten he'd 
have been able to demonstrate this evening he didn't deserve to be forgotten and indeed I hope possibly with your help to be able to rehabilitate his memory and a sort of last thought what was, what was it about coins that he liked so much well obviously he was aware of the significance of the reconstruction of the past and understanding of the present but I suspect that he really just really loved his coins like we all do as he says well some shall shall some peradventure say those coins I like well he did and we did thank you very much Thank you very much. This is really, um, I was just thinking when I read that last slide with the um, quotation by Mary Dewar, yeah. it's actually curiously wrong, isn't it? It's not just an academic sort of interest. It's really what is so fascinating about um, numismatics in, in, you know, clearly 60, but also 17th century is that political motivation to look at it, mm. you know, that, um, you know, which is perhaps rather different from the continent, isn't it? And, and um, you know, I hope that, yeah. you know, your book when it comes out really makes that comment because it really shows the importance of numismatics, um, you know, all the politicians involved and so on. I mean, are there other figures that would be comparable to um, Smith and, I mean, yeah. obviously it's Cotton and so on, but well that, that we don't know that yeah. is. Well, in England, there's very, there's, there's we, we don't really, um, no any others but I mean I think I was telling you a few weeks ago the other thing we uh, discovered quite by accident and so is the importance of the coin which is about uh, Queen Elizabeth herself and had I been asked to give the talk in the last two months rather than earlier I would have given a different talk which I would have called Queen Elizabeth and the Twelve Caesars because we have a series of letters that have come to light that again have been ignored by a scholarship that shows that um, Queen Elizabeth probably had her own coin collection uh, and, and was able to identify Roman coins, which emperors they were, and some of the reverses. And it also shows that her father, Henry VIII, had a collection which was just complete news because until recently everybody assumed the British royal collection began in the, in the 17th century. So, and as again, you know, of course, every ruler wanted to be like a Roman emperor. So mm -hmm. the fact that we've got a scene in one of these letters of Queen Elizabeth actually holding coins of the Roman Emperor in her hands and recognizing them. I mean, it, sh it shows the power of the uh, of the of history over the present. That not only Smith but his contemporaries and his monarch uh, was very conscious of the importance of the Romans and were inevitably, both I think explicitly and implicitly, mod uh, influenced by those models that they had in front of them. So that'll be, that'll be the next talk. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how would somebody like Smith go about building a collection of this sort? You know, the, the quotation that he travails to get always yeah. the coins. What, what would this travail entail? Um, the, the, the quotation from Scheck about uh, going to Germany and having coins sent or something of the sort. I mean, in, in the day before, say, a C&G auction, yeah. um, <laughs> do, do you have any idea what yeah. this travail would entail? William, William was there to yeah. send <laughs> Well, I think, um, I think, I mean, the, the answer is with Smith, we, we don't know. I think one could acquire a certain number of things through goldsmiths, that some, they, that some of them, I think, were the coin dealers of, the, um, of, of that world, because if people found for example, mm. hordes of coins, they would naturally take them to a goldsmith to get them evaluated. And Smith does mention once or twice getting gold coins tested by um, goldsmiths. I think the other thing that we don't know in his case was they, there was actually much more contact between Britain and the continent um, than we think. Um, for example, I mentioned uh, Cuspert Tunstall a bit earlier. <coughs> And we know he was in the Low Countries in the 1514 or something, 1515 on an embassy, when he actually became a great friend of the great scholar Erasmus. And in one of his letters, Erasmus says, oh, it's great having Tunstall around. He's a brilliant scholar, but he's gone missing today because he's gone off to buy some coins. <laughs> um, so I, th I think there probably was a trade across the, the channel, uh, other, you know, that plus some finds in Britain, but we don't really know. Please. Well, actually, I have a comment on what you just said, Doctor. Uh, in one of your slides, I believe it said that a plowman 
Yeah. Came up with some well, that gold so coin was the, the so one that was actually found. To yeah. this day, people are buying the boards. And one thing, uh, when was, do you know when Sir Thomas was knighted? And like, for what service? Well, he was knighted, knighted for his political, um, oh. his political achievement, and indeed the first slide I showed in the Knights of the Garter. That's the highest sort of rank of chivalry um, in Britain. So, his merits were recognised at the time, even if sadly forgotten soon after. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bob. Uh, I guess, are there any other references specifically to a particular coin, such as that one, to the the Aureus of Claudius that you can find in the manuscript where you might? And the, the Herennius piece with the N? No, I'm, I'm, I, I really, I'm afraid I, I, there are only about seven or eight, all, which are all I, I, sh I showed up on the um, on on the um, on on the um, on the slides. I mean, the um, the Aureus of Claudius. It's cu a very similar coin turns up in the collection of Robert Cotton. Mm -hmm. Now they're not. I mean, they're not common, but they aren't that rare, but it seems a bit of a coincidence, but we can't make a direct link. Um, and then, of course, what happened to Cotton's collection? It ended up in the British Museum. So I've done my best to fudge the evidence to make it seem that that might be <laughs> in the BM, but I'm afraid I can't, haven't been able to succeed, but uh, which, is, which, is, which, is, which is a pity, because I mean, some part of this study, I mean, some coins which were in British collections in certainly the early 17th century. We can now definitely say they are in the BM or somewhere else. It's what um, John Connolly in his book, his right. this wonderful word, traces for them, doesn't it? They're sufficiently rare or unusual or well described that you can trace them through, even if they're against their pedigree to the modern period. All right, we'll just go away, Peter, and then um, Saffron Walden. Is that um, memorial in the church there, or? No, that's in this place called Thaden. Thaden. Well, nobody knows how to pronounce it. Even the locals, T H E Y D O N. Thaden Mount, near another village, which is in English, is um, Gilles will have to forgive me. Is pronounced Thaden Boyce. <laughs> Thaden Bois. <laughs> um, Where is that? Well, that's that's just. It's quite near the the the, the house. Uh, if you if you go to London and you get on the central line, the underground line, more. and you go more or side to the east. And the other thing is, um, if you're ever driving to Cambridge from London, you go, I don't know, you, you go up the motorway towards Cambridge, and where it cuts the London Orbital motorway, the M25, if you look up the hill, that's where Smith's uh, house was. And he gets he, his house gets a nice view of one of the biggest motorway junctions <laughs> in the British <laughs> 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 So as we were reading through some of the 